Hello and welcome to this recording of Attitude and Ambition During Pandemics, How Chinese Business Adapted. This is a recording of a webinar hosted April 8, 2020, where four specialists talk about how Chinese business adapted to COVID-19 crisis and what were the success criteria. I'm Santeri Tuovila, I was the host of the event and I hope you will enjoy this discussion. You can jump to different topics of the panel by viewing the YouTube comments and the timestamps and enjoy. I will link this on the chat and uh, hey we actually have the first Q&A here. And You can follow the discussion here. Uh, Vesamatti Ruottinen is taking notes. Mm. And you can all comment here. We will later on use this slide deck to share after the event. And we are recording the event. So we can make this, put this on YouTube later on. So welcome again to the attitude and ambition during pandemics, how Chinese business adapted. We have a great list of panelists and uh, let me tell you the story how this event got organized. It got organized in about two and a half weeks when we were talking with Ten on, on our weekly call about Schloss and doing startup businesses in China. And Jen was really amused of this pandemics hitting West and all this toilet paper of humor that was going on in in our social media and I, I tried to explain why is this and I, I thought like perhaps it started with some person being quite um, how to say concerned about not having toilet paper during the quarantine but then people just pick it up and use it as a humor to cope with the situation. Jen thought then that perhaps she would be able to explain a little bit how, what, how it was in China and how to how the Chinese people and businesses cope with the whole quarantine thing so that we don't need to learn everything by ourselves here in the West. So that was a pretty cool idea. So I shared it with Peter and Peter was like, okay, I mean, I can talk about this thing because I, I do business globally and I see how this affects pretty much all the places in the, in the world. And with Peter also, we made an, another um, ambition and attitude event before. So it's, it's good to have these two characteristics on, on these times and fo focus on seeing the silver lining. And after this, I wanted to find a little bit like professionals, a specialist speaking on the topic. So I got really good recommendation on the group chat that I think Martin, you created this group chat on COVID talk on coronavirus talk in, in WeChat. And you have been mm -hmm. keeping that talk chat with over how many members we have there, like hundreds of members, and you have been upkeeping it the past two two months. And you you raised your hand when I asked the question who would like to join this sort of panel. And I, I got really excited, especially when you shared your LinkedIn page and showed all the statistics and analysis which you have made about the COVID-19 on, on global scale. And of course, since you live in in Shanghai and do all the business with the digital work and also supply chains. It was really nice to join, join the group. Then on the same Thank you, chat, you. yeah, sure. And then on the same chat, there is a former friend of mine from Shanghai. I, I lived there last year for a couple of months and uh, she introduced Olivia to me and said that Olivia made a really nice article on how Chinese marketers adapted to the crisis. And marketers are really in a special place here because everyone are home and only way to communicate with other people is it's digitally. And she had analyzed this really well on her two articles. I don't know if you have more articles now, but it was really insightful and you have made good, good work on taking many case examples on that. So it was really nice that you, you wanted to join to the panel as well. 
yeah, and a little bit about the reason, perhaps why I first talked with Chen and why I'm really interested in China. Is that uh, we have here, as you can see in the background, we we like to build these startup communities, and this is actually our co-working space that is quite empty now. I'm here the only guest, and uh, as we did in Tampere. And I went to China and I'm deeply fascinated on the business ecosystem in China. Last today I heard one specialist saying that let's say compare Alibaba to Amazon. Alibaba is like four years behind. And I'm as a business student really, really interested in, in this topic. So China is deeply fascinating. And we created this finest China brand with my friend Alexander Anserud, who is also there on the chat and also with Peter, with his vision to bring finest Bay Area to China and have this kind of social bridge between West and China and to bring people with, with friends to China and start making businesses there because in China it's really hard to make business without friends. So this is the background of, of me and why this event is really important and how we can now in action help companies invest with the learnings from China. And without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Chen and you can introduce yourself and what, why are you fascinated on the topic? All right, hello everyone. My name is Chen Wang. Uh, so I am heading the slash China operation currently in Shanghai. Uh, previously, I stayed in Finland for 10 years and I moved back to China in 2015. So have a very close, uh, very like a deep understanding of both of the markets. And uh, in this kind of, um, in the middle of the crisis, so my heart is really kind of goes to, uh, you know, the, the West and also, you know, uh, you know, my own people uh, in China suffering from this uh, case. And uh, this is a very interesting time in terms of business, because for me, at least, uh, for my very limited uh, years living on this planet, this is nothing that I have seen before. So uh, China is basically already three months into this crisis. So I hope there is some interesting uh, experience that I can share with uh, your fellows who are uh, going through the same curve that as uh, we had uh, one or two uh, months ago. Yeah, All thank right. you. And did I, I understood that Slush China had this year, um, was it six or seven events in different cities across China, but now it turned out you had to cancel everything except one. Uh, yes, actually since 2015 that we came to China, uh, well, or born in China, so we already expanded uh, kind of to multiple cities in China. So this year, actually, it was supposed to be a full blown out uh, year for us in terms of our uh, business expansion and also community building. Uh, however, I mean, uh, due to the, the the ban on business and also how many people can be gathered at the same time, or even just, you know, not able to travel. Uh, so we currently only keep one that is happening in October, 15th and 16th of October, and which is the biggest one. And we expect to have 15,000 people. However, to be very honest, we still keep a very close look on the regulation and also the policies that if we can still do this, because even Olympic Games is canceled this year. So we, we can't really say for sure if we uh, will have it for sure. And another, but I mean, just on the contrast. Uh, so in Finland, actually, Slush as the biggest um, startup and innovation event in whole Europe just announced uh, two days ago that uh, the, um, this kind of the, the signature event in Helsinki happens every November will be uh, canceled for the first time uh, since um, since 2007. Uh, Peter can correct me if I'm wrong. So, uh, but but in China, we, we do see the silver lining here and uh, we have very positive attitude that hopefully we can still have at least one event uh, in October. But meanwhile, I can share it a little bit later probably. Uh, we are transforming uh, everything online 
uh, platform community events. So we are exploring actually together with Peter how to have massive online events and also facilitating the matchmaking meetings um, and, and uh, even sell products uh, through a live streaming and uh, e-commerce model. So uh, we are doing massive change right here. Yeah, super. And we will definitely come back to this. Peter, you just got thrown a ball from Jen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, great to great to be be here, and uh, it's good that we use uh, use this uh, let's say uh, uh, crisis and being stuck at at uh, home and uh, wherever uh, to uh, to kind of share experiences. And yeah, I mean it's uh, of course uh, very different times. And uh, yes, Jen said uh, first time ever that uh, Slush uh, gets. Uh, the main event in Helsinki gets cancelled, so um, that's uh, of course like a big deal. Uh, but uh, what I've been uh, uh, saying now for a long time that uh, there's always uh, a lot of opportunity in any crisis, and I think that this is something that uh, uh, is very important to focus on. So uh, it's very easy to kind of get carried away with all the doom and gloom and like uh, end of the world and like everything is going down and all of that, but. Uh, I think that we should always keep in mind that uh, kind of the biggest uh, success stories, most successful companies, uh, most successful businesses have always been started uh, in uh, downturn and in crisis. And uh, actually, Slush is no uh, exception. So, uh, Slush, the first uh, event was in Helsinki in 2008, and that was kind of like the last. Uh, uh, economic crisis and, and uh, that was kind of like the great um, uh, you know recession if you will uh, and uh, then of course Lush went on to become the biggest and, and best uh, startup event on the planet so, uh, so I think that uh, it's a good uh, kind of like example of what you can do in, in a crisis and uh, what I see now uh, everywhere is that uh, everybody uh, is uh, doing uh, a lot more and there's uh, of course a lot of uh, companies that are struggling but there's also a lot of companies that are doing uh, really well and figuring out uh, and as we would say like in the startup world that they are pivoting to all kinds of like interesting directions so yeah I think that uh, every crisis is also uh, an opportunity and, and it's important that we stay focused on, uh, on kind of like moving through the crisis and I think that's what we see uh, starting to happen now in China and then uh, give it a few months here and we'll, we'll be in a different position in the rest of the world as well. So uh, always, uh, you know, like eternal optimist and, and kind of like looking at, at uh, the future, not the past. Exactly. So the best time to start an investor meeting for startups to ask money for their business is in great crisis. When it's last started last time and now it's kind of reboot of everything yeah 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 thank you and olivia hi thank hi. you yeah. so my name is olivia plotnik and i'm from the us but i've been living in china for the past five years in shanghai oddly i'm coming to you from germany today it's a long story but um as we were talking about earlier before everyone hopped on we are currently stuck outside of china so just waiting to get back in um and i'm excited to share with you today what my team and i have been following pretty closely for the past almost three months now as chen said um, i work in marketing and communications so i worked in big agencies and now i run um, a boutique digital agency in out of shanghai so we've been watching really closely how brands have been reacting what their communications have been how they've been adjusting things like this um, and hopefully we can shed some light on those topics for you today yeah. super Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we have Martin. And Martin actually knows how to get into this topic from the macro scale. So we are all in the, in the same place after the presentation. Martin, would you like to share your screen or do you want me to change slides here? Uh, you, can, you can change slides. I think it's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for invitation to this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you can see from my CV, I'm um, 
I have my roots in academia. So uh, originally I'm a dry academic uh, turned consultant turned entrepreneur. Uh, so I've been in China now for 14 years this year, actually. So I started out here as, a, as an academic doing research and training in the supply chain area. And then uh, step by step moving into the uh, consulting space. And over the years in China, I've uh, started up a number of businesses as well in a uh, quite diverse area. Um, for instance, one of my companies, it's a quantitative trading firm. Um, and that's uh, kind of the uh, knowledge and skills that I've been applying for the last uh, couple of months, you know, analyzing, crunching the numbers related to the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, I also started another company related to uh, Chinese uh, e-payment solutions. So um, it's a, a, a second tier distributor for Alipay and WeChat. Uh, and also my main business today is uh, still a, um, a business consultancy called international business consultants uh, where we help companies improve their supply chain operations and also in areas like uh, uh, digital transformation and so on and so forth so um, yeah pleasure to be here yeah. and then uh, you made a little forecast yeah to demonstrate what you are doing yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I, I uh, by the way, sorry, Martin, can you actually just enlarge your screen to full screen mode? I think it's it's something it needs to ah, really good point. Thank you, Chen. Mm. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm doing with the techniques here on the side. Yeah, so some people they have been asking me, you know, how is it, you know, to spend, uh, you know, two weeks in in quarantine, um, you know, here in China. But um, as a matter of fact, you know, I, I traveled to Sweden on the uh, 17th of January, and I, I had originally planned to stay three weeks, but it it uh, it became two months uh, eventually because of canceled flights and so on and so forth. And um, having only three days of sunshine during those two months in Sweden. I had a lot of time, <laughs> you know, doing some introspecting. So um, uh, for me, you know, crunching the coronavirus uh, pandemic numbers, for me, it's a kind of, you know, a therapy, you know, to better understand what's going on and, you know, relieving my own anxiety and fear. So uh, for today, I just wanted to share a couple of slides uh, that I don't think you have seen before, so I tried to create something uh, out of the data that is out there that is, you know, not commonly occurring in uh, in the public domain, so to say. Um, you might have seen it already if you follow my LinkedIn page, uh, but anyway, I'm just going to give you some food for thought. You know what the current situation is like and what we can expect in the next months to come. Uh, so we can skip one slide forward, please. I think we're one one backward. I'm not sure. Maybe. Is there any in between? What what was the previous? Yeah, this this is the one. Yeah, correct. <clears throat> um, yeah, the one after the title slide. Starting point. The one with a formula. Yeah. Can you see? Uh, it didn't come up on my screen, but maybe that's just a delay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now I can see it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So th this is a, a little bit interesting. So you know, as a, as an academic, I am. You know, I I started you know reading a lot of scientific papers on the topic. Yeah. yeah, I got disconnected there. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we can hear you now. 
uh, I started reading a lot of scientific papers, and the first thing that struck me is that, you know, hey, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so the papers I, I wrote, I, I realized that, you know, the formula the, that uh, academics in this field are using are way too complicated. Uh, so I just, you know, pretty much from plain logic, I started to develop uh, an own formula, you know, for how to predict uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and what you can see on the slide is uh, pretty much the result from that. Um, without going too deep into the details, you can check this slide or, you know, read on my LinkedIn page as well for all the necessary details, sort of say. But I, I basically, I developed a prediction model for the coronavirus outbreak that I started to apply on China and then subsequently, you know, on other countries and also, you know, on uh, on uh, worldwide, pretty much. Yeah, we can skip one slide. Uh, so this is uh, what the situation looks like right now. It's pretty much looking, you know, one week uh, forward. Uh, you can also see that China, represented by the red curve at the very bottom, uh, is becoming, you know, increasingly smaller and smaller so it's it's you know pretty much getting dwarfed by the development uh in the rest of the world uh, so what we, we can also see is that we're in pretty much exponential growth phase here and that you know within uh pretty much less than a week from now we will hit the two million mark in terms of number of infected globally yeah next slide please uh what's also interesting as you can see on the slide and uh, the, the chart on the left hand side is that the so-called case fatality rate has been constantly increasing over time, uh, going from uh, 1% and it's now above 5% as of today. Uh, and this is mainly due to lack of testing. So because the, the numbers are growing so fast, so countries, they simply cannot keep up with proper testing. So we, we, we have less and less insight in you know, how many are really you know, uh, uh, infected. By the coronavirus. So, as we mark what the um, case has used that as an adjustment factor on the right hand side, we can calculate something called implied infections. And that is, that, that is vastly larger than the recorded case numbers. Uh, so, whereas the, the recorded case number is, is right now about 1.4 million worldwide. Uh, the implied infections number uh, exceeded uh, 7 million uh, as of yesterday. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I think also what's interesting to note, uh, I have data for this for every single country in the world which is affected by coronavirus, but uh, these two charts list uh, the growth rates in terms of infections and deaths among the top 50. Uh, countries uh, in the world. So if we look at the, uh, the top chart with infections growth rate, we can see that where the biggest growth in coronavirus infections are happening right now is pretty much concentrated to uh, developing countries, you know, in Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, but also um, uh, Latin America. If we look at the uh, bottom chart uh, in terms of uh, death growth rate by country, we can see more of the uh, developed and Western countries uh, in this cohort. And a uh, simple reason for that is that, you know, there's a two to three week lag between infection and uh, death. Uh, so that's why, you know, this, uh, the death numbers are lagging those of the infections numbers, so to say. So, as time goes by, if we look, you know, two to three weeks into the future, we can expect, you know, more of the countries we see in the top chart, uh, you know, also, you know, picking up steam in the uh, bottom chart. Yeah, next one, please. Um, in, in order to also account for population size and the speed of infection in uh, a given country, I also develop a KPI uh, that I call Outbreak Severity Index, or OSI. Um, and basically what it means is that, uh, you know, the more infection cases, the smaller the population, and the faster the growth rate of the spread, the higher the OSI value. So just as an example, 
a value of seven implies 1,000 net new cases per day per 1 million capita. <clears throat> so here, obviously, uh, as I said, it, it accounts for population size. We can, uh, we can see that, you know, at the top here, we have several, you know, small countries which don't have many, you know, cases in absolute terms. But because of the small population size, uh, they're still very heavily uh, affected. Um, so at the top, you can see we have, you know, states like, you know, Vincent Grenadines, Falkland Islands, Vatican State, and so on and so forth. And then if you look at, you know, uh, larger states, then, you know, we have countries like Iceland, uh, Switzerland, Portugal, Spain, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Uh, final number, uh, you know, looking forward. So everyone asks, asking themselves the question, you know, where, where will this end? Uh, and pretty much, you know, by applying the model that I applied previously, you know, for China, for other countries like Spain, Italy, and so on and so forth, if we apply that, you know, the global numbers, uh, this is what we uh, end up with, pretty much. So uh, most likely, you know, uh, Citrus Paribus, if there's nothing, you know, radical happening in other external variables, we can expect about 15 million infected by the uh, beginning of June, pretty much. So this is, this is what the forecast looks like, you know, looking forward uh, a couple of months into the future. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much what I had uh, for now. So I think we can continue with the uh, uh, regional discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Martin. And this is actually a good way to jump into one question that I have yearned to ask all the experts for some time. Hmm. Can China really be compared to other countries as being two months ahead in the future of pandemics? Why, why not? Do you think China is, a, is comparable for countries, let's say, like US, Sweden, Germany, and what about you have global data from South America and Africa, Martin? Uh, my answer is uh, no. Um, I, I don't have this chart here at hand, but if, if, if you look at the development uh, of the pandemic, if you look at the trajectories, you know, from the outset in every country, also, you know, looking forward into the future, uh, China is different. Um, uh, China, China does cluster with a number of other uh, countries and regions. So um, you have also countries like uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore. You have regions like uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan as well. And they have been able to, to much, much larger extent than any other country in the world, uh, contain uh, the spread in their respective countries. So, uh, so, so, so these regions, as I said, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and China, I, I call them the outliers. And then you have uh, pretty much the rest of the world, every other country in the world, having a similar trajectory with, with different, you know, momentum, definitely. Um, within that sort of say mainstream, um, path that most company, uh, most countries take, uh, it's, it's uh, more variation in terms of the case fatality rate. And in the countries where you have a high case fatality rate, that's pretty much dependent on the median age of the infected people. So for instance, Italy has a very, very high case fatality rate if you compare it to Germany, for instance. The reason for that is, is that uh, you have a much, much bigger spread among the elderly in uh, uh, in Italy, whereas in Germany, um, it's more the younger part of the population being infected so far. Uh, that might change over time, but that's what it looks like right now. Uh, similar situation with South Korea, also much younger uh, a proportion of the population being infected. So uh, in, if you look at these, you know, trajectories over time, they don't, they don't tend to change much. If, if you have a high growth in the beginning, they, they tend to, you know, continue following that. Um, China has managed to really, you know, suppress 
uh, the spread in the country. Um, <laughs> countries like Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, they, they have some upticks right now, but it, it's still a totally different ball game. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Who, who would like to answer answer the next? How would you compare the rest of the world and China? Yeah, but I, I, I think that uh, um, probably you can't compare any like uh, nation to any other, you know, like they're, they're, of course uh, every place is kind of different. Uh, but I think that uh, one thing that uh, should come out of this uh, crisis is, is really the uh, importance of uh, sharing uh, best practices and I, I think that that is something that again uh, uh, all the governments need to do a much better job and I mean this goes for China for the US for all, uh, all the nations because it's like again it's a pandemic it's a global thing uh, and I think that uh, probably uh, you know uh, at some point uh, would be very good to analyze uh, how uh, it all played out and and I think that there's a lot to be learned and I think also, uh, I mean, even before the pandemic, uh, always been saying that uh, government should uh, do a lot more benchmarking, a lot more uh, sharing of best practices. Uh, I think that that is something that is super important. Uh, and, uh, you know, companies do that all the time. Uh, governments are like uh, super bad at that, uh, you know, and, and I think that uh, it's not just for handling uh, these kind of pandemics, but it's, it's again like... Uh, anything i mean how do you do uh, uh education how do you create like a healthy like uh, ecosystem for uh, like entrepreneurs and startups like uh, there's a lot that we can learn uh from each other and i think government should do a much better job uh, on that in general and this uh, kind of like uh, pandemic brings it to the fore that you know it's uh, you know everybody understands that if uh, uh, we can work together, you know, more efficiently, less people will die. So that's like a pretty good like motive for like uh, doing stuff. And, and that's again what I mean by uh, opportunities uh, uh, coming out of crisis that now we have to do things. And, and I think that that's uh, again, you know, it's always like uh, bad if it has to come to like people dying. Uh, but uh, again, at least now people are uh, listening and people are uh, starting to do things, so it's it's like serious, and I think that that's uh, you know kind of the good news here, if you will. Yeah, like you just attended last weekend on a hackathon, where mm. like how many countries, thirty countries were represented, and yeah, and, and actually I think that this is you know a good example of what has been happening. So I mean, uh, uh, our friends in Estonia started this like hack the crisis movement. Uh, uh, one week and uh, like uh, was it now two three weeks ago I think so you know time flies now but anyway and then the following weekend we had that happening in in Finland and now uh, we have this uh, global hack the crisis coming this uh, you know uh, weekend so uh, I think it's a great example of how people are uh, doing things getting together and uh, again getting together online to solve uh, these like big problems and there's been like a fantastic uh, uh, development, uh, fantastic ideas coming out of that, and, and I think that it's it's again a good example that now uh, people are doing, and and that's uh, uh, super good, and uh, yeah, very very kind of positive development there, uh, and uh, example of uh, uh, the ability of people, uh, you know, being able to uh, work together, and we had lots of people who said this is like my first hackathon ever, and you know, like all of that. So uh, what, what I've seen uh, actually now. Uh, uh, amazing activity like online and, and what is really cool about uh, uh, all of this is that I mean all of these tools all of these things have been there but then uh, we haven't really kind of like in many cases had to use them and now people are like like we are you know like online and, and uh, nobody needs to travel or anything and I think that uh, uh, the online events uh, I, I really see as uh, massive opportunity and, and we're only now like uh, figuring out how to do them like properly. But uh, mm. I mean, and there's uh, three that I attended only like last week and there were like thousands and thousands of one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, happening. Uh, so we had this uh, games event in London and then there was uh, uh, stock uh, or Sweden demo day in Sweden that had like thousands of meetings. And what's interesting with these that they are still like, uh, kind of like geography, but people mm. are like attending from all over the place. So it, mm. it's kind of like interesting to see that we're still doing uh, kind of like uh, 
geography specific uh, mm. events, even though uh, like nobody's there. So I think it's also this kind of like mental uh, like uh, map that we have or mental like image of events that they are like in a place and a time and, and stuff like that. Time, of course, still matters, but the place maybe a bit less. Yeah, and there, there's actually a just to follow up it a little bit. Uh, and there's a good question for from Sara. Like, are uh, there is some hidden lessons that we like key lessons that we haven't noticed from China? So in case of hackathons, there is of course a little like language barrier, and even sometimes like tech platform barrier between China and rest of the world. But like what kind of hackathons? For example, there has been in China, and uh, how this has happened in China during the past months. Like we are just now uh, waking up into this, and they're popping up everywhere. But how is the scene been in China this far? And is there somewhere where we can join these these innovation events? Like, uh, for example, Olivia and Chen, have you found any examples of this? Like online innovation hackathons in China? Maybe Chen, I don't know if you've seen any hackathons going on. All right. Uh, in terms of hackathons, I think, yes, it, it happens actually quite, uh, quite, I wouldn't say many hackathons, but there are many, like, tons of online meetings like where we come together to brainstorm uh like about solutions so i think hackathons is just one way to solve uh you know what we are facing right now i want to take actually a little bit different angle to answer the first question and also combining what sara uh, is asking about what lessons we can learn from china so um, I'm no expert on virus or, or, or international policy, so I want to actually just talk from the business perspective. Um, and uh, the, the difference actually about uh, China and also uh, the other, for example, uh, given the demographics of our audience today, maybe Western Europe or North Europe, is that actually China is already very advanced in mobile uh, internet, uh, either it's application or uh, payments. So actually a large a portion of our daily life is already uh, online and virtual. So for instance, if anyone has ever traveled to China, you know that uh, uh, we basically already abandoned cash here uh and uh most of our payments are done through either alipay or wechat and uh, also the e-commerce is very advanced here so we do most of our even groceries or our um purchasing online and it's delivered home so this is actually a very big I would say difference or even advantage of China right now in terms of you know how we are living our daily lives. So instead of queuing in the supermarkets, uh, but we are already used to a lifestyle that goods are delivered to our doors and uh, food as well. So, um, for, for instance, one of the largest uh, delivery company called Shunfeng, actually, um, their, their uh, revenue on the first quarter of the year really, uh, you know, kind of uh, increased uh, significantly for the first quarter. And then, um, so this is like one very big difference. And I think actually uh, with this uh, crisis i think most of the other countries would realize actually how necessary even uh this kind of a uh, virtual or online uh mobile uh lifestyle i would say is very critical for the for the for the future and also if you have watched the the, the game called top game i think a uh, top player sorry and that is you know a world we are re uh, living in a virtual reality basically i think if that would happen and uh, one of the biggest reasons why we are really moving towards that kind of lifestyle where we live in the virtual reality is crisis like today and people are forced actually not only to move online but move to virtual reality because what uh, what i see in china is that a lot of businesses uh, actually events not only done online but done on uh, in virtual reality worlds so, for instance, uh, HTC Vive, one of the largest, um, you know, 
VR companies in the world, they have already conducted several meetings, online meetings, uh, big events, uh, where um, either you can use your VR goggles or actually um, the events will be kind of recorded from the glasses, VR glass, and then um, live stream online. So we are, uh, viewers can participate it online as well. So I, what I see is not only that everything is moving online, but moving into a virtual uh, VR, AR, and or mixed R reality. This development is really accelerated because of the crisis. And then maybe a little bit on what I see, the business, how they are coped with this, uh, with this crisis, uh, kind of to answer uh, Sada's question a little bit from what I've seen uh, in the business world in China. Mainly, actually, there are five different aspects or, or steps. The first one is companies are doing a very kind of um, massive mental and emotional adjustments. So to their internal staff, uh, because a lot of pe people have been feared. Uh, I mean, they, they, they are uh, afraid of being laid off uh, or, you know, this kind of uncertainties with their business because the reality is that there is a big cut of their revenue. Um, so most of the industries hit are tourism, hospital, uh, I mean, hotel and uh, accommodation, uh, restaurants, this kind of offline businesses. Um, Actually, one estimation of the quarter one G, uh, GDP in China is from two uh, fr from Bloomberg is from two point two uh, five point two percent GDP growth to one point four percent. So this is like massive uh, cut uh, in terms of um, the, the the China scale. So the the mental and emotional hit is very big, and then the second one is cash flow, and I would say most or, or if it is not all, all companies are really concerned about their cash flow. There's a data actually in China that most of the companies that their cash will run out. I mean, uh, I mean, 34% of companies, their cash will run out after one month if there's no income. And then 33% of companies will run out of money uh, after two months. And then 17.9% of company will uh, run out of cash after three months of operation without uh, income. Which means that after three months, if the uh, crisis is going further, and after three months, around 85% of companies in China, I'm talking about Chinese companies particularly, they will go out of business. So this is like the government's concern to, uh, and also business concern to do everything to go to live longer, to survive, then cash flow is really, really big uh, question right now. So what I see is that mo uh, most companies are um, reducing their staff, either uh, or, or staff cost, either to give uh, to reduce their salary, or to give people uh, holiday without pay, or stop their recruitment process and lower their operation cost whatever they can to uh, minimize their operation cost and just to survive, just to live a little bit longer and wait for the screen and silver lining to come. And then the first, uh, so third thing, what I see massively in China is business transitioning, what is happening right now. So for example, I take one of uh, maybe the people who live here would know uh, a very famous hot pot uh, chain restaurants uh, called Hai Di Lao. So uh, their uh, business used to rely on the people eating in restaurants uh, mostly. So 85% of their revenue comes from this revenue stream. But due to the uh, crisis, people are not allowed to go out, not to even mention eating in their restaurants. So what they have done is that they actually uh, developed very fast their home delivery service and also turned uh, their products into, uh, for example, um, raw materials. And so people can purchase this online, not only as a meal, but as raw products as well. And actually their mother company, uh, which is listed in Hong Kong, actually their price, uh, the stock price actually even went up instead of going massively down, which is very interesting uh, fact. Yeah. And 
yeah, and also um, businesses are going online or just have more revenue stream. So I, I, I'm not sure if I'm uh, kind of talking too much, but two last points. Yeah. And the fourth, for, fourth one is that uh, companies are organizing a lot of learning and training training so because people have to do right and then so companies uh, instead of doing nothing but organize a lot of learning and and training tours so this is kind of the 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 lessons or what i've seen from most of the business in china what they do during this crisis yeah thank you that was really inform informative the we can say in in the presentation here we can change slides perhaps on the new habits on consumer and perhaps like how the companies how they are adapting into these new habits for example uh, i listened to a podcast today where they said that on the last sars crisis companies which are now really um, popular like Qingdong, it's a competitor of uh, of uh, alibaba and other e-commerce giants it used to be a, a store in beijing and in shanghai but in SARS, they actually went online. And after that, they have become one of the biggest e-commerce giants in, in the whole system. And also, that, what, that is what happened to um, Alibaba, that they were business to business. But then when nobody wanted to come to China to see the factories, they actually started to sell straight online to consumers. So there was a lot of new opportunities that happened in SARS. And now it must be much bigger. Uh, on a comment, and I want to give this question to Olivia. Uh, many companies have thought like they have hundreds of salespeople in the shopping malls, but they could not work like for the past two months. So what to do with these people? So they saw some, mm, so it made the idea that these salespeople could actually make mini video streams and uh, like go there where the customers are and where their attention is. Like, how did you see this? and? How do you see like other adaptation that companies did? Yeah, so I think the two biggest keywords that we need to kind of be thinking about that we've seen come out of China are health and online. So how can you provide people with ways to stay healthy, with ways to, you know, exercise at home, with ways to eat better at home, ways to, you know, keep your mind healthy through um, education courses, through upskilling courses, things like this. And then how can you basically shift everything online? Um, so coming back a little bit to the first question was, can you compare, you know, China to the rest of the world? And I think China really had a huge advantage because so much of activity was already online, already digital. Um, and now when I look at a lot of Western brands and how they're handling this, I see a lot of them turning actually to Instagram live. So this is like the first step your first touch point of bringing your brand online. Um, whereas China already had basically Instagram live, but the ability to also push out products through e-commerce on it. So they were really one step ahead of this. Um, and in terms of, you know, shifting consumer behaviors and what we're seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, not only go online, but new consumer groups go online. So the older generation, um, especially in China, that was home with their kids during the Chinese New Year, a lot of them, a lot of them have to do online shopping during this time. So we saw a huge market open up there. Um, we're seeing, you know, a huge preference for very fast, high convenient tech solutions. Um, we're seeing a huge preference for, you know, deliveries, for grocery deliveries, um, basically trying to shift all parts of your operation online. We're saying that what to do with all these salespeople that are now, you know, no longer, people are roaming through the malls, they're no longer having this face-to-face -face contact. They're actually having um, them do, you know, individual live streaming which is very popular in China. Um, and I'm really happy to see that actually happening, you know, for brands in the West. I see a lot of, you know, skincare brands, they are having even their, you know, their marketing manager host like a, a mini one hour workout on their Instagram live channel. So I think a lot of what has already happened um, in China and a lot of, you know, behavior is going to translate very directly to the rest of the world. So keeping an eye on China um, is going to be really important in what they did. I think, 
you know, looking at um, one brand, for example, Nike alone, Nike saw an 80% um, increase in the use of their fitness app in China. So that's a huge, huge number of people hopping online. Um, that's a huge number of people interested in how to keep themselves healthy. And so Nike is really using their model of how they adapted in China as a playbook for, um, for the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you. Mm, I somewhat lost my video, so sorry I didn't put it intentionally away. Uh, but it's it's really minor detail here. Mm, like, what about the change in consumer behaviors? Like, mm, on a podcast earlier, I I listened. It said that what happens is that perhaps the companies, and you can say if this is correct or not, that some the companies that were in a platform ecosystem with uh, Alibaba, Tencent, Jingdong, and who were native at working with the online consumers, that they could adapt faster. But then there was a big, big like portion of companies who, who were not in this ecosystem so deeply even though in China it's really hard to not to be in, in this ecosystem. Mm. So can you see like when the consumer changes, let's say like when everything comes back to normal or the new normal and we have 80% of people going back to cinemas, 80% of people going back to restaurants and what happens to the industries where this one third of the consumers have changed their behavior in this this really rapid rapid time and is there a difference between companies that are integrated in the tech platforms and uh, companies that are more traditional in their business models especially here in west where it's not so advanced as it is in china Yeah, I, I, I oh, think that it, it's uh, again, uh, if you look at uh, what's going on, it's, it's again uh, a little bit like uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, so uh, it, it's again uh, companies that uh, are uh, agile and uh, basically uh, able to cope with uh, changing environment uh, are the ones that are successful and uh, then companies that are like less nimble and uh, less adaptable you know, they uh, are struggling. And, uh, and I think that this is, again, the crisis just uh, uh, kind of like uh, brings this very much into, into the open and you can, you can kind of like tell uh, which companies know what they're doing and, and which not. But uh, obviously, I mean, if you're already like doing a lot of business online and, uh, you know, everybody's online, uh, you know, you have to be uh, pretty bad if you're not benefiting from that. I mean, that's, that's uh, and then what we see, you know, like let's take the games industry. Uh, huge growth in all the numbers and, and that's like uh, you know uh, even if the games companies would be doing nothing I mean that would happen because people are now uh, uh, stuck at home and they have uh, you know a lot of time so what do you do you know you play games you uh, watch something off Netflix or whatever or you know you attend uh, you know the skincare lesson or yoga session on, on Instagram or whatever your like platform of choice happens to be. So, so I think that that's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, just to state uh, like the obvious. Uh, but I think that uh, then uh, also what we see, and I mean, I mentioned this like events uh, thing uh, already. It's been very interesting to see how uh, quickly uh, people are then, uh, you know, canceling their events, uh, making them happen online instead of like physical and, and then, uh, a lot of learning going on. And I mean, I, I learned like a lot during last few weeks, just, uh, you know, participating in a bunch of these events. And, and I think that uh, some of the changes will be uh, very, very permanent. But then I also think that, uh, you know, once uh, we get uh, out of the crisis, and of course, I mean, tough to predict the future, but I, I think also many of these uh, kind of like uh, core, like human behaviors, I mean, uh, people are, well, okay, for the most part, like social and, and uh, uh, we're still, you know, uh, Jen mentioned the VR, AR and all of that. I, I don't really see, uh, you know, like AR, VR, uh, like the technologies. Uh, yeah, there's some growth, but I, I still think that uh, 
uh, that we're uh, we're not um, yet at the point where uh, you can really substitute uh, you know uh, face-to-face meetings and all of that. I mean, crisis or not, uh, I think people still want to meet. So so uh, we're gonna see. But uh, you know, it's it's gonna be fun to see how this uh, kind of like plays out. And and uh, as I said in the beginning, lots of opportunity uh, for the people who know what they're doing. So uh, you know, you should. Uh, try new things, do new things, and then, uh, as I always say, when you try new things, most of them like fail, but, uh, you know, some of the new things that you try are very successful, and, and that's, again, like how the big uh, success stories are born, that, you know, like, go out there, do things. That's what entrepreneurs uh, do. Hmm. I think to, to add on to what Peter was saying, you know, there, there are different stages, right? The outbreak, recovery, and stabilization. Um, and when we kind of come to the stabilization or a new normal, that's, um, I think we need to be very clear that that's not going to be a normal. Like we're not gonna return back to how things were January 1st, 2020. It's going to be um, a very, very different world. And the actions that you take now, you know, let's say that you are primarily offline brand and you've had to adapt and you know do live streaming or do all these online activities to still engage your community and bring people in and push sales um i don't you know to agree with peter basically i don't see that um being permanent like there's a bookstore in beijing and a really clever thing that they did during this time is they brought in Um, celebrities and influencers and they had them live stream um, you know reading and they were able to sell a lot of books this way I don't think that's going to be their their main business model in the future but it can certainly help them um, in the future to you know drive sales or supplement their offline activity when they're able to have that again Um, so I don't see some of these changes being permanent but maybe supplementary Um, And as well as, you know, I think we have to look at it um, in terms of, you know, what can we do right now that's going to boost traffic um, and how can we integrate that into the future? Great addition. And actually, this is a good way to talk about the new normal or or the changes that this uh, COVID-19 will make in industries. And this is a kind of question to Martin and uh, in this one slide on um, where I have pictures I open it up here hopefully everyone can see it there is a one nice Instagram picture I Mm. found on Anhui province where the tourism section was opened up again and then all the people wanted to go there and have all the (laughs) tourism that they didn't have in the past past two three months and it looked like this there was hundreds of people packed in together like it happens in china especially in the golden week in october and uh, then they had to close this tourism down so on the on the other picture there is this green uh, code that you have on your phone developed by alibaba and implemented by i think mm. by chinese government nationally And you need to show this green code. It can be green, yellow, or red. Red, you have infection. Yellow, you are traced to some place where there was a yellow person, a red person, and we cannot be sure that you have the infection or not. And green is that you are okay. And you can get a haircut if you have green green color. And uh, you can go to these places. You can go to office with your green code. So... When this China is opening up with this system, and then the rush back to the normal activities, it kind of fluctuates. Like Disneyland is not yet open, the biggest places are not yet open in China. Like, how could we interpret this globally? Hopefully, Martin, you can catch catch my question here. Like, how can we interpret this globally when different countries are opening up in different times? in different places and then they have these different uh, systems they are not completely green yet they are perhaps yellow and how could we um, adapt into this yeah. 
uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. So you know, um, uh, I'm you know you eat at, at uh, uh, some bar restaurants, some bars, uh, you know, at the bank and so on and so forth, where they you know keep track of people's health status. And um, when I see this photo, you know, from uh, you know uh, Huangshan. Uh, I, I, I get really scared, you know, when I see this. Um, even though, you know, num China has very, very few, you know, new case numbers and, and new deaths, um, there's still a risk, you know, for, there, there, there's still probably, you know, latent cases, uh, people without symptoms. So just because recorded statistics are going down, that doesn't mean, you know, that the danger is over. Uh, and, you know, you know, based on the forecast that I've done, you know, we see uh, a, a global plateau being hit, you know, in early June. That, that doesn't mean that, you know, things are over it's far from it. I would say it's, that, that's, it's, it's, it's the end of the beginning when we see a plateau uh, because there's always the risk of, you know, uh, additional waves, uh, flare-ups. Uh, and we, we have to remember that it, it only takes one person to infect a whole city, you know, a whole country, all, you know, the rest of the world. So I think the, the biggest danger that we're seeing right now is, uh, you know, the danger of complacency. You know, China started to relax, um, you know, it got worse uh, in the rest of the world. A lot of uh, returnees, you know, coming back, uh, basically fleeing from overseas, coming back to China and sort of say reinfecting uh, the country potentially, so to say. So I think uh, the way I see it, uh, every everyone has to be cautious. Every country has to be cautious um, for you know a pretty long time. You know, uh, potentially until uh, until the end of the year, un until we see any you know new cases uh, popping up in any country, uh, basically. So. Um, and then also speaking about the uh, the QR code, uh, it's also you know uh, a, a discussion topic by itself because in, in my case it worked well. You know I was yellow when I arrived in China and it flipped to green on the day when my home quarantine ended. Uh, but I also have some friends uh, that used to be green, uh, no yellow during home quarantine, and then suddenly it turned to red uh, for no reason. They didn't leave you know oh. their their apartment or anything like that. So. Uh, it, it's not a perfect system, but uh, uh, it, it's better than nothing, basically. So I think that that's you know the key point here that uh, anything anything that that you know can can help to some extent is better than nothing. Yeah. What kind of adaptation have you seen from the businesses on this system? It's like bars are open, restaurants are open, but are people really coming back to them? Uh, I mean, ba based what I'm seeing, you know, it's 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 no, it's not empty, uh, you know, in the streets. There, you know, there are less people than it used to be before uh, the outbreak. Uh, you know, I see people; they're more cautious. Uh, you know, if you go to a bar, or restaurant, you know, they have a they have a desk, you know, with hand sanitizer, temperature check. Uh, you have to register, you know, your name and contact information. Uh, people are wearing, you know, face masks, you know, pretty much at all times. Uh, maybe not so much, of course, when you're sitting while you're eating uh, or drinking. But apart from that, you, you can see that, you know, there's, um, there's still a high level of uh, awareness and um, people are on uh, alert, so to say. So, you know, wearing masks and these basic precautionary measures, that's still a uh, standard procedure. So, um, uh, it, 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 it still seems that, that that will remain in place for uh, for quite a while. Yeah, is there mm, other notions? Uh, what have you seen on the ground in, in Shanghai? Yeah, so as, as I said, you know, you have you have this kind of, you know, health screening, you, you know, when you enter venues. Uh, and you see people, they, uh, they are cautious, uh, people, even if they are outdoor, you know, they are, you know, they're wearing, they're wearing the masks and, you know, um, basic precautionary measures, uh, basically. So, uh, uh, people, people are, people are on the, uh, alert and, um, 
you, you can see that you know when when the numbers started to tick up after a lot of people returning to China, then you know people they started to get scared again. So th this is very much driven by you know the um, information which is out in the in the public domain. You know, if if there is information about you know community spread taking place, then you can see that people are instantaneously reacting. Um, so uh, I think I think the population in general very very uh, responsive. Uh, you know, based on the information which is being uh, communicated to them. Hmm. Yep. Hey. Yeah. Hey. So, hey. Actually, to my question, like to Martin and Chen. So, uh, uh, what's been kind of like the most impressive uh, kind of like innovation or like new service uh, that you've seen now, like on the ground in in uh, Shanghai? Yeah, like online, um, maybe say. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, in, in, in general, you know, what we see now is the fruit of, you know, many, many years of development, you know, where things are, you know, moving more and more to online. I think the big change that we're seeing right now is that, you know, online is being the, uh, the default option, so to say. So if you think, uh, okay, I'm hungry, I, I want to eat. Um, and then, you know, normally in the past, when, okay, let's go to the restaurant. Now the default option is, Okay, let's go to you know Meituan and, and order food. Uh, but I think in terms of innovations, I think uh, you know this uh, this QR code and you know the way that you know uh, the authorities that they are tracking, uh, you know the spread uh, of of people. I think that's one thing. Uh, what made me uh, most impressed, uh, you know, is you know how all education is uh, has moved online. So especially, you know, public education system. So I, I myself, I have two uh, kids in uh, Chinese public primary school. primary school. And, and you know, the kind of speed uh, that they took their entire, you know, public uh, education system online, considering that, you know, it's, um, it's state-owned. Taking that online, you know, in a matter of weeks, I, I think that is, you know, truly, truly yeah. impressive. By the way. Sorry? It took us like two days here. Two days? Yeah, or like a day, and everybody online. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, just a comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add a little bit to to Martin's uh, note. Actually, I think one of the most impressive thing for me also is uh, for the online education, uh, because this is massive scale, and then all. Uh, even like when I turn on my television, actually there are online education channels actually for the nearby school kids. So actually even I watched like some lessons about uh, physics or also mathematics at home, <laughs> you know, I can follow it. So <laughs> this is a very interesting phenomenon. And then actually uh, I have to uh, kind of a little bit disagree with Olivia's comment for the new normal, because I think this is kind of becoming a new normal because for my, uh, from my point of view, I haven't seen anything new, to be honest. For example, we had online education, we had home delivery, we had all those services, but you know, it was only applied to a very niche market and only the first adopters are trying out those services or products. So I think because of the virus, so it's accelerated the development and also adoption of those uh, technologies or new ways of uh, lifestyles. So, I mean, with uh, this kind of super long period, we are looking at from, you know, three months to six months, uh, you know, our life will be changed and uh, infected by the virus. So I think after the virus, things could look very different uh, how we live, for instance. Um, like for for most of our the, the workplaces um one of the biggest change also is you know we are adopting very flexible hours it's kind of never happened in china even the internet companies actually uh, people are allowed to stay at home and then to uh, even have shifts to work at uh, to work at office i think actually this is bringing very positive change to education to uh, to lifestyle and to workplaces uh, because people are forced to change. It reminded me of a very famous uh, bet actually between Jack Ma 
uh, 10 years ago between Jack Ma and also the, it used to be the richest man in China, is called Wang Jianling. Uh, his main industry, uh, business is in real estates um, about 10 years ago. They had a famous bet uh, around 10 years ago because Jack Ma's view was that everything will move to online. Basically, um, Alibaba was kind of booming at that point, but far not the scale uh, what it is right now. And then Wang Jianlin still was the richest man uh, in China. And then he, his view is like all, online would never replace offline. So his strategy was developing his offline uh, shopping mall or cinemas massively. But then, you know, uh, 10 years later, actually, Jack Ma became the richest man in China. And um, uh, Wang Jianlin actually ended up selling a lot of his properties, uh, including cinemas and, uh, you know, uh, shopping malls. So um, I think that was just an example. Some trends are just uh, not to be reversed. So I would think that uh, right now our, our life is going into a new normal. Uh, I think what we do now might actually just be a sneak peek of how life would be uh, after the crisis as well. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, what, what is actually uh, very interesting, and, and this is, uh, you know, like the opportunities that come out of the crisis that, uh, you know, if, if uh, I would have told, you know, like people here in Finland that, uh, of course, we can do this like digital transformation of our like educational system and it's going to take two days. You know, if I would have said that like last year, uh, everybody would have told me that, Peter, you're crazy again, that it's not like possible to do, you know, something like that in two days. I mean, we need to train all the teachers. We need to kind of like get everybody online. And then, you know, crisis hits, schools are closed, two days, done. And, and I think that this is, you know, like the thing. And of course, not perfect, but uh, still uh, it happened. And now we have more than a billion kids that are doing their school from home, like if you look at the global picture. And of course, it's not happening in a perfect way uh, in many places, but uh, now we have to do it. And I think that this is something that, again, it's a good reminder uh, of the fact that there are very, very few things that actually are impossible. But uh, in many cases, uh, okay, there are many reasons then why it doesn't happen, but now there is no excuse. I mean, the crisis uh, basically leaves us no alternative. Education has to go online. Okay, it's not going to, you know, stay being online only. Uh, I mean, we're going to get back to kind of like this new normal where we have a uh, bit online and we have, uh, you know, like the more traditional uh, like education as well. I mean, it's not kind of like roll over and die. But, but I think that this will leave a permanent uh, like... Uh, uh, mark on on education and and everything and and this is something that uh, again uh, uh, once we get a bit further then people will start realizing that uh, hey actually uh, this is not all bad we can do new things we can do new and better things uh, in education and in many areas and and this is again uh, kind of the opportunity that uh, is created by by crisis and, and uh, that's kind of like the really uh, important thing here that we actually use uh, and take the opportunity to learn and we are doing things like in new ways because I, I think that if we just, uh, let, let's say if you take education, if you just take uh, education as we know it right now and you just, okay, now it's like online and use Zoom and Hangouts and whatnot, uh, that's like okay, but uh, there's a lot of, uh, very interesting opportunities that opens up because now all of a sudden uh, you could imagine that you could have everybody like in the same classroom. The kids in Shanghai, the kids here in Finland, in Sweden, in Germany, wherever, uh, and you can have access to kind of like the best expert in a particular topic, and uh, he or she can come to your classroom online, mm -hmm. your lesson. And I think that there are a lot of these kind of things that uh, were not possible. Or, okay, they were possible, but they didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But now, because of the crisis, all of a sudden we realize that, hey, why not? We could invite, you know, like this Nobel Prize uh, winner to explain about, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, quantum physics to the 10 year olds or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of these kind of things that we'll see. And, and that's why, uh, I mean, I continue to be very, like, uh, bullish on, on many of these uh, 
things and we just need to kind of like keep uh, focusing on uh, the opportunities fi uh, you know fix the crisis but uh, there's you know obviously life after the crisis as well yeah and, and, uh, and this is actually for event organizer it's uh, really fun that now we are not competing with the offline events locally and geographically where people kind of in quotes have to sit and look at the keynote speakers before they can do networking now we are competing with all the online content that is happening currently but has also happened in the past so it's a as an event organizer point of view this is totally a new ball game and we just need to make new innovations why it is important to be uh, focusing the attention on the same thing at the same time but it all in the same time it leaves all the restrictions from geographically uh, olivia do, do you want to comment on on the, the new normal and uh, perhaps on which sectors has taken the best advantage out of the uh, the need for consumers to change for example elderly people this might be the first time they have to go online and consume there yeah so i i think chen and i have the same point like the um we will change we're not going back to to normal there will be um definitely a new normal that's going to look very different across all industry sectors. Um, something that I read in a report that I think was very interesting, um, you mentioned the older consumers going online um, and they have, we actually see that they now have a, a higher intent um, to purchase health and wellness products, which is pretty interesting. Um, and not just any health and wellness products, but products that have a very clear um, proposition of health and safety um, and very, have a very good brand um, reputation is really important. I think another really interesting change um, is in China with families with young children, so with, with children, um, newborns or up to two years old, um, they're looking at you know, very specific nutritional needs um, from brands and products. Um, and very ease of use. So I think there are definitely categories um, that are going to come out of this that are expanding. Um, in China, there's been a long history of um, importance of health and safety when it comes to things like um, infant formula that we had a big scandal um, a long time ago. But I think the crisis will further impact that, um, you know, in food sectors and health and fitness, things like this. Um, in other categories, you know, I think we're going to see a big increase um, in the home economy. So what appliances can you buy and purchase at home in terms of gadgets, in terms of, um, you know, cooking? There's a lot of return to people making food at home. In China, it's very, very easy to order food. I don't think I ever um, cooked at home before. I just order everything, um, but now, you know, with restaurants being limited, um, even though you could do some delivery, a lot more of the younger generation found um, that they started to learn how to cook at home. So ordering um, things that are going to help them to do that. So I think there's definitely, you know, as Chen mentioned, um, we're shifting towards a new normal um, and kind of accelerating trends that were already there, already happening. I spoke earlier about, you know, an 80% increase in Nike's fitness app. Health and fitness was already a huge trend in China. I think um, it was growing at about 12% in China, um, which is almost double the global um, or the average in the US at least. And this is only going to be accelerated in China. So I think underlying trends that were already there in terms of health and fitness, in terms of digital, are gonna be accelerated in China. Um, for the rest of the world, I think it will be uh, very interesting to see the acceleration um, in things like education, um, as well as online e-commerce. You know, I spoke earlier about a lot of brands starting to do Instagram Live. Um, and so imagine if all of those brands could have been pushing products during this time. So. I think that's uh, going to be a really interesting area to look at. I want to just add one thing to what Olivia just said. Um, I think it's very interesting, a uh, phenomenal that not only that we're going kind of like forward, but we're going backwards as well, which means that a lot of the traditional values 
for example, family, for example, you know, um, have a good rest, work-life balance, uh, fitness, uh, or environmental friendly, uh, in friendliness. Uh, this kind of really uh, so-called old-fashioned or previously really underrated values in China now are really uh, brought up to the table and people are not only discuss about it, but are actually doing it. For instance, what Olivia is saying, I mean, everyone now has to cook. So now it becomes a very essential skill. Whereas in China that, uh, you know, um, not only young people, but uh, even families, you know, rarely cook their own meals because of the convenience of home delivery and restaurants nearby. And uh, also, you know, parents are spending so much time with their kids and uh, once again realize uh, the, the value of family, of uh, you know their loved ones. Uh, so I think actually, um, virus is teaching us a lot. <laughs> um, it um, it's really an opportunity for us to kind of come together and understand. Um, we can we should define humans again. I mean, what really defines us as humans and what kind of life we should live uh, in the long run. So I, I think this is very much. Uh, talking about in China, kind of, well, now it's not exactly post uh, uh, virus crisis, but uh, kind of coming to an end. So people are uh, resetting their lifestyle, not only adjusting to the new lifestyle uh, force being changed by the virus, but people are taking initiative of changing their lifestyle because they realized what really matter for them in life. Yeah, that's really well said. And now people not just have to cook, but they have to spend time with their families, which is always nice. <laughs> There's an opportunity. Um, uh, we didn't really decide on when we will end this panel. For me, I have tons of questions and I'm infinitely mm, fascinated about the topic. But is it okay for you to still answer for me for one really, really, really special question and then uh, have a um, Q&A between the panelists? You can ask questions from each other. But would you, how is your schedule and would, will you be willing to answer this one more question from me? Uh, Sandy, actually, I'm sorry, I, I can't. Uh, I, I need to leave at uh, 5.30 sharp. So I hope the rest of you uh, have a great discussion. And uh, well, I'm because I'm with Slash China, so you can reach me at uh, chen.wang at slash.org. So uh, you're welcome to reach me and uh, we can discuss about, you know, many <laughs> things. Yeah, for example, how to travel to Shanghai virtually or physically. <laughs> yes, and how to be part of the Slush uh, startup and innovation community as well. I I'm sure Peter can talk more about it. Yeah, I have a few more minutes, so I can, I can, you know, like uh, answer any questions, no problem. Yeah, same with me. Uh, same with me. Yeah. All right, okay. then. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and then goodbye. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Chen. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Mm, yeah, I have one one question that's really dear to me, and it is when we talk about this uh, change in uh, and the possibility of companies to adapt to the change, whether they are digital natives, they already have these strategies, and then the strategies just get. Mm, really boosted because of this situation. What about the businesses that do not have the capabilities and skills to adapt? And uh, perhaps what, what could perhaps a, a really good willing business oriented startup minded entrepreneur or a corporation person do to help these people, for example, in traditional restaurant businesses, tourism, other like even sales, face-to-face -face sales in retail. Uh, how could we help with innovation for these people to cope? For example, Martin said that this is not really over before the final person is cured or we have some sort of uh, vaccination that can take for years. Like how could we 
assess startup-minded people, help with innovation for the smaller people, smaller <laughs> players to cope with the situation and and get get back into the business. And is there good case examples in China? Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, have a very short answer to that. And it's like universal answer is that uh, basically you just have to do stuff. I mean, that it's as simple as that. So I, I don't think that there's any, you know, like uh, um, other like silver bullet or, or anything. And I think that people are already doing and uh, people are, uh, you know, kind of like coping with this. So, so again, uh, doing things, doing things together. I mean, that's, that's kind of like uh, typically good way to solve any problem out there, you know, uh, virus or not. Okay, so, yeah, Olivia, you, you're muted. Let me unmute you here. I'm you unmuted, sorry. Yeah. So uh, I work with a lot of small brands, um, startups and small businesses in China, and this obviously was a huge blow to them. And, you know, we had a lot of, Clients who um, just because they had no sales and had to, um, you know, cut their digital spend, cut their marketing activities. Um, but this doesn't mean that you have to stop producing um, content. I think Peter brings up a really good point that you just have to do it, whether that's your, you know, your CEO or your marketing manager or your sales posting on LinkedIn, you know, I've seen a lot of great posts about, you know, what people's working from home situation is like. Um, you don't really need to come up with these amazing campaigns right now. You just need to be communicating with your consumers, with your audience. Um, you need to be very raw, very real with them, very transparent. Um, and you can do this, you know, without a budget, without a, a huge team behind you. So, you know, to add on to Peter's point, you um, don't stop, don't halt everything, don't go on hold. Um, keep producing, keep communicating, keep trying to provide value, um, be very transparent. There was a great example. Uh, actually, it's not a Chinese brand, but it's a, a U.S. startup brand in the travel industry they um they make luggage um and they you know on their instagram yesterday they posted a message that they had to lay off a lot of their staff um and this is a very you know heartfelt very transparent message and you saw a lot of people rally behind the brand even then and say you know thank you for communicating with us um we still stand behind you so you know not going dark, I think, is going to be the one very basic thing that you can do at this time. Yeah. Martin, do you want to comment? Give a suggestion. Um, yeah, I can just add a few points. Uh, so I, I uh, very much agree with uh, with Peter. You know, in a sense that uh, you know, continue what you have been you know doing you know if if you haven't been online in the past uh, this is definitely you know the time to go online so it's, it's you no know, it's uh, much uh, you know where everyone is online um, you know with uh, with e-commerce and uh, you know home delivery and so on and so forth so uh, as a, from a consumer point of view, you, you can get everything you need, you know, delivered to your doorstep. Uh, many restaurants uh, and so on and, and retailers, they are selling online already. So I don't, I don't think there's um, a giant leap there. So I think it, it's more the question is, if you're running uh, uh, both an offline and an online business, this might be the trigger offline business basically 
I think that that's what we will see. I mean, I see myself in my neighborhood, you know, I, I already see a lot of stores, you know, closing down because, you know, there are not enough uh, offline customers, you know, going out and, and going to stores. Whether that will can't really hear you very well, Martin. To normal. Yeah, you couldn't hear? Nah, it yeah. must be the network. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but so, so what I said, what, what I said is, the question is not whether you should go online, the question is, should you keep your offline business? I think that is the main question right now for many businesses. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's actually a very good point. And this is actually even if you look at uh, kind of like pretty traditional business like restaurants, uh, you know, should you move to a model where you have like this kind of like, uh, you know, dark kitchen and you just like deliver. And I mean, that's been a massive trend already that, uh, you know, for restaurants, the, uh, you know, space is, is like uh, the cost, the rent and all of that. And then if you can basically just be somewhere in a not so expensive area and you just run like a big kitchen and then you just deliver. And, and I think that this is something that will also accelerate. Uh, and uh, and then that's just like one of many examples. And I think there are many, many businesses that uh, are uh, kind of like seriously asking themselves now that do we actually even need this like offline? And, yeah. and that's, that's uh, a very good question in many, many businesses. Mm. Yeah. And Hey, I, I just actually yeah. I shared a link in the chat with like everybody, but I, I just uh, think it's it's kind of like a great example of uh, you know kind of like what's going on. So uh, you know, uh, and I could ask like how many were planning to go to Minsk for their venture day, uh, you know, in in Minsk, Belarus, like next week. And I'm guessing that not too many of you were planning to go to Minsk, and many have probably not even been there. So I've been there; yeah, it's like really. a great event for that you know like hmm. community in uh, in uh, you know the region and in belarus uh you know it's home of like uh, war gaming and uh, you know the fiber development team is there and masquerade was done uh, there that uh, you know like uh, facebook acquired so i mean lots of like cool companies but the point is that now because of the crisis they're online and now anybody can go to minsk but of course you're not really going to minsk but you're going to the event and i think that this is something again that uh, I think it's an example of uh, the fact that the crisis is opening up uh, fantastic opportunities that uh, the Minsk guys, okay, maybe they were planning to stream the event or maybe not, but now because of the crisis, you know, the only alternative is to actually participate online, which means that it's not only like the Minsk community and the region, but they can reach the world. And, and I think that this is, again, uh, a lot of things that uh, also the event organizers uh, need to rethink, you know, their uh, thing. And I think that we're going to see a lot of like uh, super cool online events. Uh, but again, it's not just, you know, OK, let's stream the event, but you need to uh, support all of these uh, things. Uh, I mean, for me, events are all about meeting the people. So I don't really care about like the presentations. I mean, that's like, OK. But uh, it's about, you know, like the ad hoc, you know, uh, meetings, the whole like serendipity thing. So uh, again, uh, it's not just about streaming keynotes and panels like we are doing now, but it's also then uh, giving people the opportunity to meet with other people. And I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, very cool development that I'm seeing in, in exactly that area. So uh, we're going to see uh, very, very uh, cool online events going forward. Yeah, thank thank you for that. Mm. From the notion like how, where the world is so moving see, into. See you in Minsk. Exactly. Online. Yeah, take your friend yeah. with you and participate and hang yeah, around exactly, in Minsk. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one question I kind of like to summarize what you talked like. Now it's the time to go online. Now it's the time to not to stop doing things. And we have a audience question. Like, for example, this can be a business for someone who wants to put their business on, especially on the communication side. Like, what is, 
like some companies are afraid of sending message to their clientele because it could damage their reputation. What is the safe topics companies can use? And perhaps some company can help these companies to like speak in the right way that it doesn't come like, first of all, it doesn't uh, severe people's health in these times. Like, what, what is a good way? Yes, yeah, so I think this is a really great question because a lot of brands, this is a really sensitive subject, right? There are, uh, we're talking about the changes and the opportunities, but the real fact is there's people dying and people getting very sick. So it's a very, very sensitive topic that you don't want to come off on um, too lightly. So a lot of brands for sure are very afraid of what to say and what topics are going to be okay and how to phrase things um, as a, you know, like a luxury brand should not be giving updates on current deaths or on, you know, the number of infected cases. Um, what you should be doing is, you know, talking about the, talking about the, the impact in a way that makes sense for your brand. Um, so to give you an example, we work with a brand who sells um, sustainable solutions for household products. And they put out a lot of content on, you know, uh, one of their best performing articles was on, you know, what house plants can you buy to um, improve your immunity and your health and things like this. So touching on subjects like how to keep yourself healthy, um, how to keep yourself occupied, you know, what you can do with your time. Those are a little bit more safe than going into the details of what is going on. Um, of course, it needs to make sense for your brand you still need to stay on brand you don't need to turn into a news outlet um, but you can kind of shift your messaging into how can you help people basically yeah martin peter do you want to comment I, I can just add a, a very brief uh, comment. You know, I think uh, communication is, is like, you know, uh, any other type of communication, you know, uh, in, in writing only try to communicate, you know, um, positive news. If you have any bad news or, or whatever, it's better to do it, you know, face to face or at least, you know, uh, verbally, so to say. So um, uh, I think that's a rule that applies also in this uh, particular context. Hmm. Hey, also, I mean, like, uh, I guess we have a few more minutes. So uh, if anybody like in the audience uh, wants to ask something, uh, you should, because I think that's like the most fun part anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, if there's anything that you want to ask, go for it. And I'm sure somebody can even bring you uh, here yeah, in the form of like video if, if needed, but also like feel free to ask in the Q&A or chat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. if you want to. Uh come live and pr present yourself uh, that is possible in, in, in Zoom webinar. Just raise your hand or like send a chat. Exactly. Mm, like uh, while waiting um, or let's say wait for a couple of seconds because I think audience's questions are more important and interesting than mine. But I, I have one coming. And also, if, if you, Olivia, Peter, and Martin have some questions for each other, please, please ask. OK. Um, what well, one question, it's about uh, like this analogy of green, yellow, and red. And now that the countries, they are closing down and opening up in different places. And hopefully we are not going to have any second waves, but that's always a possibility. How, how is this going to affect international trade? Um, and let's say for also the supply chain, are we going to see these countries opening, closing, opening, closing for the next couple of years? Ho hopefully this is not the scenario. Is this something to be adapted? And when, when can we expect on getting back to China? Uh, May 15th. Okay. Uh, of course, the answer is like nobody knows. 
And, and uh, I think that this is kind of the whole point here that uh, we have to be ready for anything. I mean, always crisis or not. And, and I think that this is uh, again, uh, you know, like uh, uh, super important. And, and uh, we kind of discussed that before that the companies that are able uh, to adapt to the, you know, new normal or new world or whatever. I mean, it's the world we live in. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, no different in a crisis. The crisis just basically brings all of this, you know, uh, uh, up, uh, you know, in, in a kind of extreme way. But I mean, it's the same thing uh, every day for a company, people, you know, you have to adapt to, to the world. I mean, typically uh, the world will not adapt to you. And the crisis, I mean, makes that very clear that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can think about, uh, you know, or you can have any kind of opinion about the coronavirus, but it doesn't change it. I mean, it's like there and uh, will it come back in the fall? Nobody knows. If it comes back, I mean, we should be prepared. And I mean, people are working on uh, vaccines, people are working on like many things, but, uh, but again, uh, uh, we need to be prepared for anything and, and always uh, in crisis, uh, there's opportunity. And, uh, you know, we touched on the education opportunity. All of a sudden, billion plus kids uh, all at home, they need to be online. Uh, we don't have the perfect tools. Uh, many places are struggling with that transformation. Uh, massive opportunity for, uh, you know, people in, in uh, online education, just simple example. And there, the list goes on and on. So uh, nobody knows what will, uh, what will happen in the future, but uh, we need to be ready for anything. And uh, when it comes to supply chain and all of that, I mean, of course, companies are now rethinking their supply chain and looking at, okay, how can they be more resilient uh, going forward, not depend on, uh, you know, China alone or any, uh, you know, like uh, uh, kind of like production hub alone. Uh, but this is again, uh, uh, kind of like normal, that uh, if you want to be successful, if you want to keep your business alive, you better adapt or die. As simple as that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I can just uh, add a few comments here as well. Um, you know, now if, if we go back, you know, look at the, uh, the facts, if we look at the statistics, there's only one country in the world which has truly been able, you know, to contain uh, the outbreak, and that is China. Uh, there are other countries that have, you know, managed to, uh, to manage the outbreak well, as I said earlier, you know, for instance, Singapore, South Korea, and so on. But even in these uh, countries, uh, we see a re-emergence uh, of the virus uh, already, uh, these places, uh, they've already have uh, experienced a second wave. Uh, Hong Kong, you know, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, and, and South Korea. So, you know, considering how well they are managing the outbreak, uh, whereas I unfortunately have to say the rest of the world are not really keeping up to the same standard, I doubt there will be many more countries that will not see you know, a second wave or, you know, uptick in the numbers after, you know, they get the first wave under control, so to say. So uh, some people might, you know, believe I'm, I'm pessimist, but uh, again, I'm just looking at the numbers. So I think we have to be prepared uh, for that and be vigilant and have the proper measures in place in order to cope with it and uh, take basic uh, precautionary action in order to make sure uh, it, it happened to the least extent possible. But uh, we, we definitely have to be prepared for it. Hmm. Yeah, we had one question in the, in the audience. Actually, now, now we have two. What is the one thing that a business with zero online presence should do first? Thank you, Vera, for the question. Okay. In China. Okay, so not even start the online presence in, let's say, Finland, but start it in China. Yeah, but I mean, I was like, the question was about launching in the Chinese market. So, uh, yeah. yeah. 
then of probably course. you want to have some visibility in China and not in Finland. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think under any circumstance, um, virus or not, you need to understand, you know, who you are selling to. Um, and, you know, if your product is actually going to be relevant in the Chinese market, I think a lot of foreign brands still have this idea that, okay, just because we're a foreign brand, <clears throat> you know, we're going to make it in China. Um, there is no, um, to put it bluntly, there's no way that's happening anymore. There's um, immense amount of domestic competition uh, and people don't really care um, about brand origin that much anymore. So before you do anything, you need to understand, you know, your target consumer and what actually their touch points are. Um, potentially, you know, they are on different channels. They're maybe not on the big e-commerce players. So I think that's definitely your first step. Um, I will say that, you know, launching in China is very, very expensive and it's not for every brand. So it really takes a lot of um, cautious approach. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I, I totally agree there. I, I think um, the big I think the biggest mistake that any business does is that, you know, they start by this kind of uh, deductive logic, uh, you know, saying that, yeah, you know, China has 1.4 billion uh, inhabitants. Uh, if we cap, if we capture, you know, X percent market share, um, you know, we will have this or that much revenue, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the question is, you know, how, how do you get that X percent market share? You know, how, how much time will it require? How much investment will that require? So I, I think really, you know, before before you start, you know, launching any business, you know, get boots on the ground and, you know, really try to understand and, and you know, uh, learn about the market here because it's, it's very easy to get overly excited and getting, uh, you know, carried, carried away uh, by all the big numbers that you see here. So get boots on the ground, learn, educate yourself, and uh, be very, very realistic and also understand it's um, probably the most competitive market uh, in the world. So, uh, uh, you know, you can be excited, but, you know, be careful at the same time. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, uh, one question uh, Peter already answered. And... Uh, really shortly is uh, and you can answer by saying is there any possibilities to do this and perhaps has there been cases in china so now the case question like the biggest stakeholders usually can do this and uh, now that we are we cannot do exports we cannot do trade visits so should the public sector if i understood correctly support uh, and give resources for companies to go online. Has there been cases in this, in any places? And what have been the best cases for perhaps public sector giving this export money to online, online presence for companies? Yeah, I, I pers personally, I, I don't have too much knowledge about, uh, you know, that uh, uh, myself. But uh, as far as I know, there's no money, you know, for specifically going online. Uh, to my knowledge, there is, you know, different types of, you know, uh, loans or, you know, subsidies that you can apply for, you know, to basically, you know, save the finances of your business, but not specifically for going online, to my knowledge. Uh, please correct me if, if I'm wrong. but that that's uh, the knowledge i have yeah i can't think of any like fantastic examples either so yeah 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 i also have to go to uh, the next online meeting so uh, uh Guess we're like ready to wrap up or what sound better? Yes.
we are and thank you super much for the afternoon and the noon spent here answering the questions and uh, we get plenty of thank yous from from the audience here and uh, the audience like we are now online so it's just going to grow so we keep up the conversation we are in wechat we are happy to invite you there so you met met us and let's keep up the conversation there i, I will share the um, how, how to do it later on and uh, we will publish this in, in youtube and perhaps yoku in china as well and you can always watch this and add on and comment and we'll get back to into it and then again super much thank yous for our great panelists olivia peter martin for joining and please you can say your last um, greetings to the audience where can they connect you and where can they see you next at least peter they can see in minsk <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, that minsk event but but yeah so i mean i'm uh, obviously you know i'm easy on to find on like twitter and uh, linkedin and whatnot and then uh, uh yeah feel free to contact me on on wechat uh, as well so the mighty eagle on uh, wechat easy to find as well and, and actually, hey, just a suggestion for like the next one that we do, we should have like a group uh, QR code. You could like share that and then it's super easy for people to join the WeChat group. So uh, lots of things we can do uh, to connect. But uh, anyway, uh, let's do more of these. I think it's, uh, you know, now that we're all stuck, you know, like uh, online. So why not then make the most of it? And uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to do uh, more interaction, more panels and, and all that. So uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for joining on, on my behalf as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, I would like to thank you as well for your attention. It's uh, been a pleasure to be here, sharing my knowledge and exchanging thoughts and ideas today. Uh, to connect with me, you can do that most easily through LinkedIn. So just search for me there and then we can connect through WeChat, email, whatever. Uh, I normally hang out in uh, Shanghai as well, so if, you're, um, if our roads cross, feel free to let me know. Uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in person, even though online is nice, but uh, offline, I must say, even better. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, same with Martin and Peter. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. That's the easiest place to find me. And um, WeChat as well. Um, you can just type in my full name. So hope to see you guys. And thank you so much for the excellent questions. I learned a lot as well from the other panelists. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I added a QR code to the slide set. And uh, what I personally learned as an event organizer is that it's cool to have some sort of like a sense making session with all the people, participants, just like one hour before the panel. So everybody can meet each other and talk and kind of have this thing like, and uh, then we can go into the panel and ask, ask questions. So then there is more this people meeting each other aspect as well. That's my learning from today, from all the other insights. So then thank you very much. Looking forward for the next time. Uh, have a have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you all the participants. You can find the link to the PowerPoint presentation. I share it one more time on the chat and then I just keep the chat open for some time if there's any personal questions for me relating to this community event or anything else that's on your mind. Thank you very much.